Hello, and thank you all for making it to the final session, Constructing Solutions. My name is Taylor Jones, and I'm a law student and part of the steering committee for the forum. Our panelists for this session are Tracy Kesey, current deputy commissioner for training for the New York City Police Department, True Pettigrew, founder and CEO of True Access, Song Richardson, senior associate dean at the University of California, California Irvine School of Law, Scott Roberts, Senior Campaign Director for Color of Change, Lori Robinson, Professor at George Mason University, in 2014 co-chair to the White House Task Force on 21st Century Policing, Stephen Russian, Assistant Professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Our first question for the panel is, what is your prescription for a solution? All right, wonderful. So I, my name is Guy Charles. I'll be moderating the panel. Um, you all have made it through. Uh, the final session, so <laughs> congratulations to you. We do have a great, great set of panelists. Uh, and as Taylor said, the first question for them um, is, um, all right, you are czar and czarinas of the world. Let us open up with what is the solution. And, and um, we're going to start down on the other end uh, with Lori Robinson oh. and make our way down the row. Well, thank you, Guy. Well, we've had a terrific uh, set of panels today, and I think a number of these thoughts have been under discussion uh, from our panelists. But I want to focus in on recommendations that the White House panel that I had the honor and opportunity to co-chair for President Obama, who I still think of as our president, <laughs> uh, uh, offered uh, just two years ago uh, from uh, this time. Uh, and this set of recommendations, by the way, is under very active consideration uh, by police departments around the country. And I think as we look at solutions, that it is very important for police organizations uh, to, in fact, embrace, obviously, the need for change. Mm -hmm. uh, we said that law enforcement really needs to embrace a guardian rather than a warrior mindset uh, as they interact with communities. This notion of a guardian mindset is something that actually Plato uh, advanced when he talked about democracies. Uh, and toward that end of building trust with communities, we also urge that police agencies adopt what's known as procedural justice uh, as the principle to guide their interactions with the citizens uh, that they serve, which is all about uh, fair uh, and respectful policing, which is really what we've been uh, speaking about all day. Uh, and as part of that, we said that agencies really need to embrace a, a culture of transparency, to be very open about uh, information, for example, to share data with communities uh, on all the things that we've uh, been uh, discussing and having the conversation about uh, today on use of force, uh, on officer-involved shootings, uh, on diversity within their departments, uh, on uh, deaths in custody. And one thing we said is very important is for departments uh, to undertake annual community surveys uh, to, in effect, like a business, do customer surveys uh, to find out how the public is feeling about the agency. Uh, we also, and, and we certainly have discussed this uh, over the day, we talked a lot about the need for education and training uh, in areas like procedural justice, on de-escalation, <clears throat> on handling of individuals with mental illness. And one important area was training on communication skills. Uh, you know, academies are very good at teaching how to use a gun, uh, how to drive cars fast, but there's very little attention, very few hours devoted uh, to learning how to talk to people, how to communicate. Uh, so those kind of skills are very uh, essential uh, for police officers. Uh, we also said that agencies also need to acknowledge the role of policing in past injustice and discrimination, that you have to get those issues out on the table. Uh, before progress can be made. 
Uh, and we also talked about the need to consider the collateral consequences of crime-fighting strategies. Our whole discussion of uh, this morning on stop and frisk and broken windows, those kind of uh, strategies, uh, that crime uh, reduction alone is not uh, self-justifying. Uh, so uh, those are some of the kind of issues, and uh, I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying that one of the issues we did not get to, but I think is essential, is a focus on hiring uh, to really pay attention not just to, uh, to diversity, though that is uh, very important uh, in the racial area, but also in uh, cultural diversity and to hiring, uh, in my view, more women into police departments. Uh, the uh, percentage of women in policing has remained static over several decades. Uh, we know from research that women bring very different characteristics to policing uh, than men do. And I think my own view is that more females on police forces would be very helpful uh, and bring uh, some of the, the things to policing that would be uh, helpful uh, as we uh, are moving into the 21st century uh, and would be a very helpful asset. Thank you, Laura. You've said you've said a lot. And I want to at some point I'm going to come back to to some of these things. But let us go now to Stephen. Great. So um, I'll say at the outset that I'm a law professor. So the way that I typically look at uh, an issue like this is thinking not just about the goals that we want to achieve, which I think many on the panel here would agree with, uh, but the, the the legal means, the laws that we need to change uh, to get to those ultimate goals. Um, so I think the, the the question was posed as if if, if, if I had complete power to, to enact some sort of legal change that I think would reduce police misconduct, um, I have a pretty ambitious idea that draws on a historical parallel that I would like to do. Um, I think the historical parallel that we can think about whenever we think about the modern problem of police misconduct um, is how we dealt with voter suppression in the mid-20th century. Um, so I recently, I have a book coming out and I have another article coming out with a, with a co-author of mine, Jason Mazzoni at Illinois. Uh, where we advance the argument that um, if we want to figure out the proper role of the federal government in responding to local police misconduct, um, we can look to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as a blueprint for how we could expand the federal government's role in regulating police departments. Um, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, the basic problems that we faced in fighting voter suppression in the mid-20th century. Um, so in the mid-20th century, we had a serious national epidemic, as many people here know, that uh, black Americans were systematically denied the right to vote by local municipalities all across the country. Uh, Congress took several steps to try to address this. Uh, one thing Congress did was Congress empowered the Department of Justice with the ability to, uh, uh, to bring criminal charges against those who engaged in voter suppression efforts. Uh, Congress also gave the power to the Department of Justice to seek civil suits against municipalities that engaged in voter suppression. Now, both of these efforts largely failed at achieving uh, real uh, removal of the barriers to, to disenfranchisement across the country. Uh, they failed because the Department of Justice lacked the resources uh, to enforce those measures. Once you would target one municipality, inevitably a different municipality would themselves try to engage in voter suppression. Uh, there was no way to ensure long-term sustainable change because once you left the municipality, they would go back to business as usual soon after that. Um, and we, I would argue, are basically at the same point in responding to police misconduct um, that our country was in responding to voter suppression right around 1957. Um, so we have now at the federal level two tools very similar to those two tools. Uh, we have Section 242 that empowers the Department of Justice to file criminal charges against a police officer that willfully deprives someone of their civil rights. Um, like in the case of voter suppression, it's used infrequently and it's often not successful. We also have Section 14141, uh, which gives the Department of Justice the power to seek something called equitable relief, to basically go to a federal district judge and to get them to order a police department to make policy and procedural reforms if they're systematically violating the Constitution. This has been used against, uh, to, uh, this has been used to investigate 60 police departments. Um, it's been used to bind the hands and force reform in 30 police departments. 
And these are many of the largest police departments in the country, but they still represent a tiny fraction of the 18,000 police departments across the country. So we're suffering from essentially the same, at least structurally, many of the same problems. Uh, we have a serious national epidemic, a civil rights issue requiring some sort of national response. We have localities that are not engaging in protecting civil rights at the local level, and a federal government that's overtaxed and doesn't have the, uh, the data, the resources, um, or the ability to target the 18,000 localities that may be engaged in misconduct. So uh, what Congress did in response to that was we first passed the Voting Rights Act of 19, or the, 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 rather the Civil Rights Act of 1960, that started to collect data on voter suppression efforts. So the DOJ now had data to respond to these issues. And finally, we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that established something called a coverage formula. What it said is that if a municipality had, had enacted a test or device to try to deny someone the right to vote in 1964, or hadn't met certain, certain voter registration marks by 1964, they were effectively covered. And they were then mandated to make certain uh, reforms uh, to shore up uh, the challenges of voter suppression. Um, because of this, the state where I'm from, Alabama, went from 11% uh, voter registration for black Americans in 1956 to over 51% in 1966. A dramatic uh, change that made the VRA the most successful civil rights statute of our time. So if I was going to propose a pretty ambitious solution, I think it's time for a Voting Rights Act of 1965 style law to regulate local police departments. Uh, that would require us first to collect a lot more data on what police departments do, data on things like officer-involved shootings that we can keep uniformly across departments, data on officer contacts, data perhaps on even things like the number of civil suits, judgments for civil suits, et cetera, and civilian complaints. And then use that data to construct a formula that will capture a larger number of police departments and then force those police departments to make a set amount of reforms. And much like in the 1950s, we have a blueprint. We have federal consent decrees that we could turn to, to to decide what kind of reforms we would require those police departments to implement. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it during question and answer. It's an ambitious idea. It's an idea that, given the current political climate, uh, is not very likely to be passed by Congress. Uh, but then again, I think if I was imagining a solution that would force localities, like places in my home state of Alabama, right, places that are totally unwilling to, on their own, adopt protections necessary to ensure constitutional rights for all of its citizens, um, I think the federal government serves a pretty important role in doing that. Um, and I think this is a way to overcome some of the resource constraints that we suffer from right now at the federal level. Thank you. Um, Tracy. Well, good afternoon, I should say. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, one more time. Good afternoon. We're not good that sleepy. Good afternoon. Sleep. I realize I'm standing between you and happy hour, but <laughs> let's, we're going to do this today. So the one thing I think that today has made abundantly clear, and I, I don't think you know, I can just speak for myself, is that the issue is, is extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. And it is emotional, psychological, and all of those things that are involved when you are talking about the issue of race and policing. And so for 27 years, I have been doing this. I, I currently am responsible for the direction of training for 50,000 people at NYPD. And I ask myself this question every day, and I pose this question not only to myself, but to the community and to our executive staff. And, and the question is this. What, are, what does the community want from police? And in that question, it's not an easy one, it's not one to be asked or answered very quickly. Also wrapped up in that question is not only, you know, what kind of policing do you want? What kind of police officer do you want? And what type of public safety? And how do you define public safety? And, and I think that the fact that we have not really sat down and answered those questions makes my job a little bit more difficult. And I say this because training is not the answer to everything. Let me be perfectly clear. We have people that should not be in policing. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I could give you six months, 1,000 hours, bring you back, and do all types of things. 
and you're not going to respond. And I think that we have to manage not only the expectations of community and organizations around policing, but we have to be honest and own what we think we can and cannot do. And I think when, you know, if you're going to make me the czar, and, you know, and I know pronouns are important, but it's That's Zarina and Yeah, czar, okay, Zarina, powerful. <laughs> all those, I have many faults. I know you do. But I try That's to work right. on I them. I still love you, though. <laughs> so, so when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about it from a couple of perspectives, so you know. So from a police officer perspective, which I was socialized and continue to be socialized and impacted by, I think about it from, you know, my, my only sole objective for the day, hopefully an honest answer, is to go to a call, do what I can, and go home. That's it. Hoping I never have to interact too much or to create too much drama or even draw attention to myself because I have a supervisor. So I'm going to hopefully do what they ask me to do or what they need me to do, follow policies. If I'm lucky enough, maybe I'll promote, make some money. But one of the things that's not reinforced or discussed is why. Why did I choose this profession? And some departments will tell you that, you know, it's not about the money. Um, it certainly is not. It clearly is not about the hours. I mean, you work in shift work. Sometimes it's not even about the partner sitting next to you because sometimes they're a little bit twisted. <laughs> not that I don't love you, but you know how no, that I goes, right, right? <laughs> so, so the questions that are being asked today and the focus that has to be as Zarina, however you want to put that, is really fundamental questions. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental questions sometimes get so convoluted, we get distracted about what really we are trying to do here. And I think I've heard multiple times, and, I, and I'm in agreement with, most officers do not understand their own policing history. And uh, all of the conversations that I've heard today, if, if I were to have roll call here, officers would be looking at you like, what are you talking about? We have no idea what you're talking about. In fact, officers will tell you, we don't even know how we got to this point in time today that we're talking about this. And so when I am thinking about how do we teach officers not only how to interact with community and to have an interaction that's safe for both, everybody who's involved in that, but I also have to think about not just trauma, but collective trauma, right? So not just of the community, but if you don't think I'm dealing with officers who are traumatized mm -hmm. and have wellness issues, I most certainly am. And I'm also trying to think about how do we then take four generations of police officers on NYPD who were trained under four different policing perspectives, who all have individual ownership into their own personal safety, and tell them after 10, 15, 25 years of having no action or no interaction that has you know, necessarily ended in a, in a terrible way, that what you've been doing is wrong. And these are realities of what those of us who are doing this work contend with every day. So the social scientist in me gets everything that was happening today and all those conversations that are happening today. And my role and my job is to not only take what was voiced here today and try to bring some, I can never do it justice, especially for someone who's reliving their trauma, and a lot of people were doing that today, and I'm appreciative of that. But to take what was discussed today and deliver that to a group of people who are not aware that these things are even happening in their space. That we are in a sense, and it's been said historically a number of times, that we are operating in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. And so Zarina would say the first thing that I need to do and that, I, that I'm doing now is I have to find a shared language. And that shared language is just the beginning. And that shared language is necessary for us to have the depth and the breadth and the emotional conversation like we've been having all day for officers to be able to begin to listen. Right, so I'm saying listen, not respond, not deflect, not defend, but to listen. Listening is a very difficult skill for police officers, especially when we've trained them to control. And the thing that we're very cognizant of is the fact that historically, we know that race is embedded in our DNA. How we accept that, how we own that, 
how we learn from that is what's critical here. We're in this moment of time where officers themselves are questioning, well, we've done it one way for eight years. That didn't work. Maybe it's time for us to go back to the way we used to do it. And I'm hearing this from officers who weren't alive during Rodney King or Pryor. Mm -hmm. These are kids just getting out of the academy. So that should tell you something about a collective narrative in policing. And so taking all of those things into account, one of the things that I think that we have to really think about as we want to sort of deconstruct, I never say reform, you want to deconstruct, reconstruct, um, burn down, redo, you know, whatever it is that we think about. But how do we begin to bring folks to the table who can inform policing in a way in which it does have a result that we all can be comfortable with? And when you think about that sort of ask that I have, it's as simple as this, right? So I've been in a lot of discussions, and I've heard a lot of uh, discussions about you know, abolishing policing. There's various forms of that. Um, I clearly understand it. But when I hear and have that conversation, and then I move to another community of elders, they're saying, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want you to go away. We want you to be there. And so when you were having these sort of mixed responses or mixed asked, I have, I guess, more questions than I do as a czar of answers of how do you reconcile that? How do you ask a 25-year-old to go into situations and often make split-second decisions and to take all of that with and to make the correct response? More so as we think about how do we begin to sort of to move forward and what do we want this to be, we have to ask ourselves not only you know, about the co-production of policing, co-production of justice, which at the basis of everything is about power. And what does that look like? What does that mean and what does that feel like? And is that the answer? So I think that as we, you know, we have our discussions today, um, when I usually come to these, this is more my therapy session than probably everybody else's, because I am the one that has to really kind of think about and help guide um, the police commissioner and to challenge those old notions of community policing, of what really was a community partnership, because those partnerships would have held together in trying times and so they really were not authentic partnerships then. So we are all talking about how do we do this now? How do we attract, screen, train, educate, re-educate, provide counseling to? How do we create folks who would like to be a part of what we know or we believe or we hope can happen in a society where policing in its historical state was not about protecting all? It's a very difficult question. It's an interesting conundrum. I think the 21st Century Policing Task Force, which I was a part of on body-worn cameras, I think that that is our outstanding framework. But there are so many pieces that we have to unpack and we have to talk about and we have to cry over, and we have to scream about, and we have to digest and rethink in order to move us forward. So, you know, Zarina didn't give you much other than the fact what keeps me up at night, but I think that these are critical things that we have to begin to think about. And one of my roles is to talk with law enforcement about ownership and complicity and transparency and all of those things procedural justice, implicit bias, all of that's new language in law enforcement. All of those concepts are new. And so we are now trying to just not only lift up what we have already identified, but how do you then begin to change a culture? And is it truly fair to ask one portion of, an organi of a government organization to solve this issue alone? We're part of a criminal justice system, broader systems. 
So that's sort of my not answer answer, but it is those things that we have got to deal with. <clears throat> Thank you, I will be back. Um, song. <clears throat> It has been an incredible day. I have learned so much from all of the panels today and from the questions from all of you. I don't even know where to start now. I came here at the beginning of the day thinking, I know exactly what I'm gonna say at the end of the day, and then I've spent the entire day writing in this notebook all the different things that I've heard from all of you, trying to reconcile them with my own thinking uh, about policing and policing in communities of color. And so some of this is not gonna, I, I'm just gonna mention a number of things that I've been thinking about throughout the day. Uh, the primary thing, however, is when we think about how, what are the recommendations to reform the police? I think that's the second question. The first question is, what do we, what do we mean when we talk about policing? What do we want if we're going to have a police department? And then to start thinking about how we construct that institution. So when people talk about abolishing the police, someone mentioned earlier how you get laughed out of many rooms and out of many uh, 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 academies when you mention that, right? They dismiss you completely when you talk about let's abolish the police, but I think we actually need to take that question and idea seriously because it's the only way, in my view, to then think about if we're gonna have the police, what do we want them to do and what do we want them to look like? Because right now, if I were to become a police officer and I think of myself as one of the most egalitarian people I know, right? I would make the best police officer ever. I could do it better than you, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I couldn't, right? That's my point. If I, if I became a police officer, I would work within an institution that is structured within a certain way. So even diversifying police departments, which I think is incredibly important, is not sufficient. Because once you get there, there are incentives to engage in certain types of policing, right? If you want to get promoted, you are going to engage in certain types of behavior. So let me mention one specific recommendation, although some of the recommendations I've heard uh, both today and on this panel, I agree with. But I wanna talk about one that was already raised today on panel two, because I was going to raise it this time. What I was gonna say is one of the things we definitely need to do without question is to stop broken windows policing, is to stop stops and frisks. And let me just explain a couple of the reasons why I personally feel this way. So first, we didn't actually have stop and frisks before the decision of Terry versus Ohio. Let me rephrase that. We did have stops and frisks and very problematic police citizen interactions prior to Terry versus Ohio, which is a Supreme Court decision that granted police legal authority to conduct stops and frisks. But prior to that, any sort of behavior like that would have been unconstitutional. So there was a world in which we lived where these stops and frisks were happening, but they didn't have the law behind it. The Supreme Court then said, okay, stops and frisks are great, right? As long as you have reasonable suspicion of criminal activity, you can go ahead and stop people, force an interaction, and then put their hands over a person's body, as we heard the pastor talk about earlier. Here's my problem with that, and, and, and uh, I, there was a police officer, uh, a former police officer, I think, on that panel who said there are certain types of stops and frisks, there's the bad stops and frisks, but then there are the stops and frisks that can be based on information that you observe. And so here's where I just need to mention two things. One is we've heard a lot about unconscious or implicit racial bias today. And police departments across the country have been getting training on implicit bias. I do some of this training, except that when I do it, my goal is not to reduce the implicit bias of a particular officer. That is impossible. We live in a world where we are taught that black equals criminal. And until that changes, we all have these unconscious bias. My goal is not to make you no longer unconsciously biased. That is a loser proposition. My goal is to say, because we have these implicit biases, we need to think about 
What institutional changes are we going to make in policing? And so my view is the one that we need to make, one important one, is to get rid of stop and frisk. Why? If you know about unconscious bias, what you understand is that stop and frisk cannot work in an unbiased way. Because as all the studies demonstrate over and over and over again, unconscious bias means that when you are acting uh, on your judgment of ambiguous behavior, which is exactly what stops and frisk are about, because otherwise you'd have probable cause, that's a problem too, but I'm not gonna talk about that. When you are making judgments about ambiguous behaviors, that's when unconscious racial bias influences you. Study after study after study demonstrates that if you are a person of color, your ambiguous actions are viewed as more criminal. And especially if you're an officer thinking about crime, because thinking about crime triggers unconscious racial bias. So if you're an officer and you're gonna engage in broken windows policing, you're gonna engage in stops and frisks, your view of ambiguous behaviors, your attention, first of all, is gonna be drawn to blacks present in the environment. That's one thing that unconscious bias does. Secondly, once my attention is drawn and I see your ambiguous behaviors, I am more likely to view your ambiguous behaviors as criminal and potentially dangerous if you're black versus if you're white. We often don't talk about implicit or unconscious white favoritism, which works in exactly the opposite way where it takes more evidence, more unambiguous evidence of criminality before I think a white person is engaged in criminal activity. That's the flip side of unconscious racial bias. So stops and frisks cannot help but work in a racially biased way. And let me mention one final thing of why I would abandon stops and frisks as something that is uh, something we encourage police to do. And that is something called racial anxiety. And the only thing I'll say about this, because we've talked about this a lot today, actually, mm -hmm. but there is evidence, all of you probably feel this, if you've ever been in an interracial interaction, you likely have suffered from racial anxiety. And what that means is, if you're the dominant person, if you're the white person talking to a person of color, you're anxious because you're egalitarian. You are anxious. That person of color thinks that you're a racist. <laughs> and if you are the person of color, your racial anxiety is, I'm worried that you, white person, are a racist and you're gonna treat me in a racially discriminatory way, either consciously or unconsciously. So both people, this is racial anxiety, and when two people are suffering from racial anxiety, you can imagine how horrible that interaction is. Police suffer from racial anxiety. They fear that when they're interacting with someone in the community, that person thinks that this officer is a racist, even if that officer is not, or believes that he or she is not. And what happens? There's a study I'll quickly tell you about, then I'm done, Guy, which is officers who fear most that they are going to be judged to be racist. And there's no uh, relationship between this, this concern about appearing racist and conscious or unconscious racial bias. It's a separate thing. Officers in real life who are very concerned about being judged as racist are more likely in real life to have used deadly force against young black men. I'll say that one more time. The office, there's no relationship to conscious or unconscious bias, right? So officers who fear most that they are gonna be incorrectly judged as a racist are more likely in real life to have used force against young black men relative to other races. That's racial anxiety. Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't have to say, but if you're a young black man dealing with an officer, you are suffering not just from racial anxiety, but real reasonable anxiety, right? You're gonna run away, of course you are. So two people engaged, an officer and a citizen, especially a citizen of color, engaged in a stop and frisk, that situation is much more likely to result in the use of force. So that's one concrete recommendation that I would say. No stop and frisks, no broken windows policing, no field investigation cards, none of that stuff, right? Wait until you have probable cause of criminal activity, whatever that is. I'm not saying that that's easy either. Thank you, Song. Uh, at some point, I would like to come back and ask to define probable cause just so that yes. we have a sense of, of what we're talking about here. Yeah. True. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, Guy. And um, I, I love being up here with all of these beautiful minds. I mean, I'm, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to sit with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it really is a pleasure to be here. And when I think about proposed solutions, right, some things that we can do, and just basing on the experience that I've had in engaging law enforcement officers and working with them, being on the receiving end of training, offering training as well. Uh, something that you, you touched on, Tracy, and you, you kind of touched on it as well, Song, is understanding why, right? To me, it all starts with why and understanding the, the purpose of why you want to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. Having that department or that agency have a clarity of purpose as to why that department or agency exists. And it may sound simple, right? Well, that we all know why the police exists, but I, I really challenge departments, agencies, and officers to really think through what is your agency or department's purpose? Why do you exist? Because once you have a clarity of purpose for why you exist, it really informs how you do what you do, right? And then not only does it inform how you do what you do, it also gives you a sense of clarity of who you should and shouldn't align yourself with from strategic partnerships and alliances and even hiring practices mm -hmm. and how you communicate yourself and how you present yourself. Having clarity of purpose just helps you make more precise decisions and impactful decisions in every discipline of your existence and your operation. Right? And so then if you look at the individuals, and, and you touched on this as, as well, Tracy, when, look, there are, there, are prim there are three primary ways that we all are going to provide for ourselves. Right? And I get that a lot of people take jobs, take positions and jobs in law enforcement because they want that paycheck. I get it. Right? But all of us in here, we're either going to have a job, we're going to have a career, but we're gonna to respond to a calling that's been placed on our lives. And I believe because of the significance, the severity and the importance of the role, I believe we all should be in alignment with our assignments, whatever we do in life. But because of the importance of the role that law enforcement plays in this world, in this society, I personally believe you should be responding to a calling to be in that position, right? Because Otherwise, I'm not sure you're going to be able to lead with love in the way that we need our law enforcement officers to operate and to exist and to function and exercise and show that level of empathy and compassion that's necessary if it's not a calling, if it's not where you are supposed to be, if it's not aligned with your gifts and your passions and your talents and the way that you're wired, then all of those things that we're here talking about today, it increases the likelihood of those incidents and those issues to take place. So not to oversimplify this, right, but from a solution standpoint, it's basically three uh, approaches or, or three-pronged approach, if you will. And it's gonna sound simple. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it's not as complicated either, right? To be able to Meet people where they are, right? That's the first step, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Be able to meet people where they are, right? Then that second step is to be able to love people where they are. Even if you don't love where they are, you have to have the capacity to love people where they are if you're going to be in that position. And then that takes us to that third step of the ability to lead people where we know they need to go to help elevate them. Because it's that guardian mindset that we talked about in the beginning that's part of that 21st century, 21st century policing document, you know, allowing that to take priority over that warrior mindset, that guardian mindset, right? And that's, that, that gets us there. And one of the things that I share when I do uh, provide some trainings to law enforcement officers is because I understand, and I'm gonna be real stereotypical right here, so pardon me is that um, there needs to be some tactical application behind a lot of these things, right? And so the, the meet people where they are, there's, a, there's an acronym that we've developed 
for how to meet people where they are based on the, the word meet, right? And that M is you have to make time to engage. You have to make time to engage the, your citizens and the members of that community and not just allow it to be a reactive time, um, uh, situation where you're engaging members of the community when something bad is happening. Because if the only time that I'm seeing you and having an experience with you is when something bad is happening, that is going to inform the perception that I'm gonna have of you. So make time to engage. Go out and meet that shop owner, that store owner. Uh, that 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 citizen that or that those kids playing playing in the street or what make time to engage and then that first E is once you make the time to engage and create some positive interactions, then that first E is explore similarities and differences because there are similarities and differences just because of the industry that you're in as law enforcement. But then when we talk about the cultural and the racial similarities and differences. It's okay that there are differences, but we need to explore what those similarities and differences are. Because it's through those differences and that diversity that innovation is born and solutions can be born out of that in ways that we could come together to solve some of these issues and solve some of these challenges and embrace those differences. Have that cultural curiosity to understand, wow, here are some ways that we're different, but here are also a lot of ways that we're similar. So explore those similarities and differences. And then that second E is encourage Respect. Simply because someone's reality is not the same as yours is no reason to be dismissive of their reality. Right? We have to encourage respect and not be dismissive of what someone is really feeling or has experienced or has gone through. And then that, that T is about taking responsibility. I mean, we talk about what that uniform represents to a lot of people. And uh, I remember hearing, um, a talk uh, the FBI director gave, I don't know if he's still the director, it was a couple of years ago, but talking about the inheritance that comes with that uniform. And for whatever reasons you, want to decide, you decided to be in law enforcement, you have to understand that there's an inheritance that comes with that. That you may want to do it because of a sense of pride, a sense of heritage, your family was this, and that badge represents honor, and, and all of those things are true. But you also have to understand the, 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 the ugly side of that, right? The history of that, particularly with people of color and their experiences with law enforcement. And just really going back to slave patrol and police officers being part of the slave patrol, there is an inheritance that comes with that, that you have to understand that a lot of times when people see you and they see that uniform, that conjures up some bad experiences. So it's not personal, it's not about that officer. But in, in my case, being living in LA, I lived in LA, I remember coming out of a 7-Eleven, I remember a bunch of officers swarming up on this 7-Eleven. I remember this so clearly. And I'm like, wow, it's about to go down, like something's about to go down. And they jump out, jump on me, grab me, throw me to the ground, knee in my back, gun to my head, and I remember the officer saying, oh please, give me a reason. Right? I mean, I, if, if I would have sneezed, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Right? So for a long time, I carried that. So this was an officer in LA. I grew up in Baltimore. I had bad experiences in Baltimore, so I already had some negative perceptions and impressions of law enforcement. Lived in New York. I've lived in Boston. I've lived in Atlanta. Right? And so it didn't matter where the officer was from at that time, whether I was in New York, in Boston, it was what that uniform represented. So, but all stakeholders need to take responsibility. One of the things that I challenge officers with is, okay, we're here to talk about solutions and the things that we can do to contribute to the solution. But I also want you guys to think about what are some of the things that you have been doing that has contributed to the problem? So let's take responsibility as well. And so I think those are some of the things that I believe, Guy, are some proposed solutions is to be able to meet people where they are, then be able to love people where they are, in an effort to lead them where they need to go. Thank you, True. Scott. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, first of all, let me just say, you know, I'm very um, honored to be here. I want to thank all the folks here at the university for uh, inviting 
uh, Color of Change as an organization and, my, and me personally uh, to participate in this conversation. Really want to uh, acknowledge the contributions of the previous panelists, these folks who've already spoken. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here, participating in this conversation. Um, I'm glad, Guy, that you phrased the question as if I was the czar of the world, because I have some pretty, uh, some people might call them radical solutions. I don't know. Um, but Frank, um, I think we have to deal with the fundamental issues that have led us to this situation. I don't personally think that we're going to fix um, the issues that we're talking about today by, you know, making some tweaks around the margins of policing policy or trying to improve the interpersonal skills of people who have signed up to be police officers under the current culture of policing in the United States. Um, I think, um, um, Tracy, you asked a, you posed a question of, um, and raised a critical point around the community's need to figure out what our solutions are, what we want. You phrase that question as what do we want from policing and I would scratch the end of it and I would say what do, what do our communities want? I think this is part of the problem. If you, if you go into communities and say, do you want to abolish the police? <laughs> they say no, <laughs> they, can't, they don't have an alternative in mind. Mm -hmm. There was an article um, shortly after Trump was talking about sending the feds into Chicago, uh, I, was, I think it was in the, in the Washington Post, a reporter had just gone around in Chicago doing man on the street interviews and barbershops, salons, and he was just asking people, should Trump send in the National Guard to deal with all of this violence? Um, and he was in, you know, some of the some of the communities that are really where the violence is really concentrated, right? Like people were talking earlier about violence being up in a very few cities, but even those cities is up in very like neighborhoods. At the, it's at the neighborhood level, right? Um, not, I'm not asking. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, the, but. Um, those people were, a lot of them were like, yeah, send in the National Guard, right? Because when given a A or B choice, right, people prefer something besides violence, right? Um, so I think what we have to think about is what, what, are, what are the outcomes we want what, for our communities? And I agree with Tracy, like communities have to come together and figure that out. Um, I'm not so much into the, especially given that fact, this, the kind of notion, even that this, I think undergirds today even, <laughs> that like we have to have, we need to come together as equal partners, police and community, and figure it out. I don't think that police need to have a warrior mentality. I don't think they need to have a guardian mentality either. I think, you know, I'm the guardian to my four-year-old daughter. I'm in charge of her, you know. Um, they need to have what Martin Luther King used to talk about. They need to have a servant mentality in our communities, right? They are supposed to be working for us. Um, now, when we can't figure out what we want them to do, again, that's a, that's a point where we need to get together as a community and figure that out, not get together with them and figure it out, in my opinion. Um, in terms of what we do want, I think, for me, that, I think if you talk to most people, it's pretty, it, you can come down with some simple things. There's a, what we want, not just from law enforcement, but from the larger criminal justice system, is to provide for safety and justice in our communities, right? We want to be safe from harm and we want justice, and I think, in, the criminal, in our criminal justice system, we've really twisted around what the notion of justice is, right? We've equated justice with, um, with punishment, basically, right? And, but if we were to, say, talk about racial justice, I think most of us would understand that as um, work to repair harms against someone, right? So I think we don't, put, we don't often put the victims or survivors of harm out front um, when we're thinking about these issues. And so I, th I would say, what, what does a world look like where we're actually addressing what's happening to people, what they need um, in the wake of that harm, and what is actually going to make our community safe? Because as we also know, it's not always policing that is making our community safe. And if you go to some of the safest communities in America, it's not like they're blanketed with police. Um, the difference is between safe communities and not safe is often at, the, at an economic and social level, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the issues that we have to address. The real issues that have led us to the point where there are some black people who are saying we need more cops, and there might be some who are saying we want to abolish the cops are the, are the same things. They, it, it is, and I know nobody wants to hear it, sorry. It's 400 years of oppression, um, uh, degradation in these communities, targeting of, of these communities, state violence, um, and vigilante violence against these communities. Uh, being held out of the economy 
um, in so many ways. You have that leads you to a place where you have communities that have high levels of crime, and so we often um, we go through this cycle. I'll try to wrap up with this. So we go through this cycle. We have ongoing issues in in certain communities. Um, the communities do something to to raise the level of the problems to a crisis for the whole country. So we saw whether it be this kind of Black Lives Matter moment where we're using technology and protest and a range of other things to, to, to raise these issues or whether it be, you know, going back a few decades when um, crime was actually at a height, right? And we, um, you know, also, you know, rung the alarm there. We have to do something about these things, right? The, the, the fundamental issue for, for both of these things to me is the worst practices of American capitalism along with white supremacy in America. Like these are the things that have led these communities to the point where they have both of these problems, right? And until we deal with those, we're not going to fix policing. Like the policing is a symptom. So my suggestions, <laughs> um, and these are coming out of some work that I did do with um, uh, other black folks around the country. Um, as a member of the Movement for Black Lives policy table, the Movement for Black Lives is kind of the formal, um, um, loose, loose coalition of organizations um, working in what most people would think of as the Movement for Black Lives, right? So you have, I'm sorry, as the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So you have Black Lives Matter, which is an organization, but most, and also the overall, I guess, brand of the movement. This is like the formal relationship. And we put out the vision for Black Lives. You can find it at M the number four, bl.com. Um, some of the things that we're suggesting, they have nothing to do with um, policing, really, and they, they certainly don't involve, I think, police departments on their own volition doing things differently. Um, one, uh, decriminalize. We have to you know, decrease the number of things that police are coming into our communities for, the number of things that our people can be locked up for, arrested for, et cetera. Um, uh, we use this phrase, invest, divest. We have to invest more in the things that will resolve the fundamental issues in these communities. Um, education, jobs, health care, including mental health. Um, and we need to invest less in law enforcement every time. With, this is the step in the cycle, right? After we've raised the alarm, here come the solutions, the so-called solutions, right? And they are usually coming from politicians, bureaucrats, or, or business people, right? Like they say, oh, you got, everybody needs body cameras. And next thing you know, the taser company who makes all these body cameras, they're making a killing, and cops are still making a killing of black people. They're just catching on camera, and nobody cares. And then the state of North Carolina says, you guys can't see the video anyway, right? So, sorry. And, uh, and there, I have some other things, but the last thing I'll say is community control. This is getting back to this gar warrior, g guardian versus servant, right? Like, the community needs to be directing um, the police, like the communities that they serve. It was part of the challenge is that we live in these large, you know, jurisdictions that have varying communities, and sometimes these communities are in conflict. And the people who don't live in the most police communities are really controlling police policy. And so we have to figure that piece out. And that goes along with what Tracy was saying, which is we must, you know, as communities, figure out ways that we got that we can come together, have these conversations, figure out what it is that we want, and uh, and and push our you know, local officials to take those stances. But we have a lot of opportunities to fight around some of these issues, like, like where we're spending our money in local budget fights. If we want to decriminalize, we can go to elected officials. We can also go to folks like prosecutors who can tell police, hey, I'm not going to charge people for these things. Stop arresting them. Um, so th there are, are a number of approaches we can take that don't just involve us going to police departments, asking them to do things differently. Although, again, I, I definitely respect the work that everyone is doing here. I know that it's coming from a positive places. So some of them are... Some, some of the things that folks are suggesting will have positive impacts, but ultimately I think if we're going to really resolve the problem, we gotta get more to the fundamentals. All right, this is, this is excellent. So let me take a, a moment to pose um, a question that identifies, I think, four or five structural issues that you all have talked about that are both relevant to solutions as well as problems, because it seems that this, this panel is as good as providing, so, uh, articulating why there are structural barriers and problems mm -hmm. as it is as providing solutions. So let me, let me try to summarize what I understood a number of you to, to be saying and then invite um, anyone to jump in and for you to have a conversation 
uh, among uh, be, uh, one another, between, with one another. Um, so I want to start with uh, something that um, Tracy started off with that is also related to, to a point that Lori made. And the question is, how do we get these different types of communities to talk to one another? Um, and to, to go back to something that Scott just said, there's a, there's a way in which you said, Scott, well, it's not clear how much you need. Right, what, are, what are the partners that you need at the table, right? So, um, so it wasn't clear to me if you were saying, look, it isn't necessary to, to, to how much is it, how necessary is it to bring the police to the table? And if it is, and if it's necessary to bring these different types of communities to the table, how can we get them to talk to one another? And this is coming from uh, something that you said, Tracy, in terms of um, if, that, if the room today were full or, or half of police officers, um, the conversation, they wouldn't, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't understand any of the things that were going on here, if I understood what you were saying correctly. They, they wouldn't relate to it. They wouldn't resonate to it. With well, I mean, it. I, they would relate to it, but probably not in the way in which you think they don't relate to it. Well, okay, right. They wouldn't relate to it in the way that it was intended. Is that, is that That's fair? Correct. Right. That's right. Correct. And so, so it presents a, a question, especially if change necessitates bringing different types of stakeholders who understand the world very differently to the table, um, what can be done to get these different people um, who have different epistemologies, right, to, 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 to understand the perspective that the other is coming from so that that change can happen? Um, the second thing that I understood is a point about decentralization. And this came um, a lot more from Stephen's comments on the Voting Rights Act as a, as a model. Um, and as uh, he mentioned, a number of people mentioned, there are what, I think you said 18,000, um, right? I mean, you're, you're sort of the, a vast number of different types of um, police forces and, and practices, et cetera, and decentralization seems to be a burden. Now, your model is to try to centralize by getting the federal government involved, right? And as you mentioned, politically, at least at this stage, it doesn't seem to be um, viable, what can be done um, to address, overcome the burden of decentralization, especially if uh, centralization, federalizing, right, passing a federal statute um, is not going to be useful. Um, third, I understood you all to talk about the problem of under and over policing, um, all right, so this is a point that, that, um, that some of you made in terms of um, uh, how do you, you have different types of communities, and if you ask them, do you want more, do you want the National Guard, some will say yes, some will say no. Um, how do we address the problem of, of over and under policing in which communities, and how do you do with the, with the culture? So, true, you were talking about trying to get the police to change their, their mentality. What are the incentives for making that happen, right? I don't imagine it simply happens through instruction. Someone talked about the fact that, that training is, is, is not sufficient. Um, and then lastly, this came in all of your comments, um, the broader structural problem. So the big, you know, we've talked about white supremacy all day. We've talked about also capitalism. We've talked about jobs. Those big structural problems seem to be um, significant impediments to addressing what is, a, what is a, a, an acute set of questions. So where is it that we can make some headway, really, and, um, and addressing this problem. What do you want to leave these folks here with? You know, what is the one thing that you would, you would want to say to them as they're walking out of here in terms of where it is that they can make a significant difference, especially dealing with these larger structural problems, as important as they are, um, are really long-term, and some might argue even intractable, right? We're not going to get rid of capitalism for as, as an example, or maybe I'm, I, I don't have a, a strong enough imagination. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we seem to be going the other way. Um, so, um, right? Debatable. How, debatable. Okay, fine. Um, what what are what are some of the things that that folks can do uh, before they walk as they're walking out of here that they can take with them um, to make some headway on the problem? All right. Take whatever piece of any of that that you want. Um, and Lori, I see you have your hand up. I'll stand so that I can. Yeah, I, I was actually going to say, I, I would actually take decentralization probably off the list mm -hmm. uh, for this reason. When we were doing the uh, 21st century policing report, 
Uh, and we had a lot of opportunity to interact with the president. I still call him the president. Um, and he was really interested in this issue. Uh, but because of the way, of course, that our country is structured with federalism uh, and the decentralization of local towns and cities, and they all want their local police chiefs. I mean, this is an issue that unless uh, the, the movement generally wants to start looking at kind of um, pushing back and uh, kind of uh, conglomeration of uh, and centralization of counties and towns. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very political issue. Mm -hmm. and, and so that would be very hard to tackle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and just to expand on that, like I, I may have come off as somebody who thinks that decentralization is like an evil. I think it's not necessarily, like, I mean, part of decentralization is that law enforcement are necessarily going to be closer to the people. And that's a good thing. And a lot, and a, 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 a lot of the uh, solutions we've talked about here involve law enforcement being more directly accountable to the people that they serve. But I would say that I think part of the challenge of decentralization is more if we view it as the macro problem of police misconduct across the country. And if, you know, I'm from Alabama, there is a lot of jurisdictions in Alabama uh, where it is politically popular to um, not support police reform, to, uh, you know, whenever, if, if President Obama, whenever he was in office, if the federal government was to investigate a, a jurisdiction in Alabama, the politically popular thing to do would be to oppose that investigation, to oppose uh, constitutional reform in that case. Um, so I think you know, a federal solution is not going to be the end all be all, clearly. It, it, mm -hmm. it cannot be. The federal government, because of our federal system, is going to be a, 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 a backstop. It's going to be a backstop right. to handle the worst of the worst cases. Um, with that said, though, I still think there are, there are ways that we could improve the federal government's role as a backstop to capture more bad cases. Yeah, don't yeah. disagree. But yeah, I think I think we think we're in agreement on that. I think data keeping is just like like step number one to get to that point. You yeah. know, and is it data? Is that what yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Song is that you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Something you you said, Stephen, uh, triggered this thought in terms of thinking about whether we want to centralize or not uh, police departments and. Um, one of the things that that might do, but I'm not sure, is within police departments themselves, there are part of your what, what you wanted us to do, Guy, was to also think about how can we reach across the aisle? Mm -hmm. How can we bring right. other people in? Right. And so what I want to say in terms of thinking about this question, there are people within police departments who actually agree with a lot of what the more progressive people here, or even, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right term, um, uh, that's decent people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. That's decent, right. Uh, want. And many in police departments, there are a couple of structural problems within police departments for those officers who actually want change. First is there is no whistleblower protection that I'm aware of at all. And so officers who actually come out and whisper or find someone to disclose that horrible officer out there on the street doing the jump outs in Chicago, for instance. It's the whistleblower officer whose career is over. Uh, so whistleblower protection for police, I think critically important. Another is there are, and, and I don't know how this is gonna, I just have to say it, unions. So let's think about police unions for a moment, right? So we have, we know about the, the, the bad police unions, right? The ones who have all the problematic contracts, et cetera. Within police departments, however, there are unions. Let's talk about the black officer police unions in certain departments who actually don't agree with the collective bargaining union. And if we can also figure out some way to empower those officers within those specialized unions within police departments to work with members of communities, although I know you disagree completely with this, Scott, in, in terms of the, the, the working with. Did like, the black police union talk to black? No, no, no. The black, the, <laughs> what I'm talking about is the community involving police as an institution. I'm That's what I mean. Bit, yeah, OK. <laughs> you said you're terrified a little bit? I, I, no, no, I you, he will, clarified. he clarified oh, okay. a, a bit. So, I so I mean, yeah, OK, so good. Then we're on the, right? But if we can work with, with those within the existing institution who we might have some 
agreement with, if we can empower both people in the community, us, and people within the institution who might agree with us, I think that's one of the, the things that we can take away from this, is to try to figure out a way to do that. Whistleblower protection and reaching to those members within the police department who actually care and believe what some of us up here believe. So I agree with, you know, having this, you know, conversation or reaching out to those folks who, who truly want to make a change internally, but one of the things that we really, you know, are not talking about, and it's probably a panel all on its own, is the black officer. Mm -hmm. The inherent stress and tension mm -hmm. of representing not only communities that are often, you know, folks that they respond to who look like them, but this tension of when you arrive, how you're accepted and perceived. And then going back to the larger organization, how you're accepted and perceived. And so I think one of the things that we've always historically talked about, and, and you hear this a lot, is about how departments should be reflective of the communities in which they serve. And we know that even through studies that that's great and all, it's fabulous. But that's not the answer either, right? And so I think that we're talking about something that is more than that. And, and so when we talk about culture, we talk about organizational culture, um, you are talking about a culture that is intertwined with your life, your public safety, your ability to go home, right? And that's a powerful thing. And I think that when we think about, you know, how do we talk about unions, identity groups, you know, all of those things, the other question that is on the table that's usually, you know, very provocative is are these groups harming more than they're hurting? Are we perpetuating something that is not allowing us to get to what we really need to get to? And what do you think the answer to that question is? You know, I'm, I'm conflicted. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I'm conflicted because there were times when that was my solace. I had to go to folks who look like me mm -hmm. to do things. And I and I'll you know and I'll and there's other times where I was like you know given a side eye like I don't know what you're talking about on this deal. Mm -hmm. But there is though a collective narrative of the identity folks inside organizations and we do this at NYPD you know we have we have women's month we just did black history month and you know I delivered the remarks for black history month and we talk about that we talk about this parallel experience that's happening not only in our community but it's also being lived internally inside an organization so in your experience do you think that that reaching to the affinity groups inside the organization is that a productive way of getting internalized change so to it depends on what you're asking them to do because you're talking about a group of people whose jobs are on the line mm -hmm. and that's the reality right i would love you know nothing more for folks to be empowered you know not even just folks who look like us but women i mean the studies already told you you have more you know female officers mm -hmm. use the force goes down mm -hmm. right but you know i've yet to have my academy classes be 70 percent women because mm -hmm. that triggers something completely different so i think that when we talk about you know how do you cross that bridge or how do you reach out and do that, I go back again to the notion of what I call the power of the past. And I think you mentioned it as well. Does everything require the police to be in that conversation? Right, because a lot of times there are things that are happening, one, because we're the only entity that's open 24 seven, we're the only entity that's delivering whatever that service may be. And we talk about mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Being a first responder, you know, we do CIT training um, so folks can identify folks who are, are, are under stress and having, having issues. But I question whether or not it's more appropriate to have uh, mental health workers responding first, right? I'm, I'm back here, you know, if it goes wrong and gets violent, but you need to come, you need to come on mm -hmm. and have that conversation. And, and you know, and that's, you know, in the, in the way in which we are, are shifting the way we do policing, that's a big part of that. It's like we now are starting to back off of this is not a police response. Stop, just because we are here and we answer the phone at three in the morning, this is not our deal. And you know, there's, you know, I'm all about holding us accountable, but I'm also all about holding mental health and hospitals right. accountable, social workers accountable, any other government services supposed to be providing a service should be working 24 seven. That, the crisis that, doesn't happen from nine to five. Yeah, true. The clarity of role, right? That's, that gets, back, absolutely, to, that gets absolutely back to clarity of your role. Absolutely. What, what is your purpose? Why do you exist, right? Mm -hmm. And absolutely. so stay, being able to stay in your lane, no disrespect, but right, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. is no, but not- No, stay in your lane. Right, everything, right. Is not, everything is not about you or, or for you. And so 
Gia, just want to touch on one of the things you talked about, mm -hmm. about the, um, I can't see you, but I'm talking to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's <laughs> blocking me. <laughs> um, like about the, 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 the efficacy of, of the training, right? And then how involved should the community be? I believe that, and there, there's some studies that support this, so it's not just based on my belief, but I do believe this based on some of the just qualitative insights, right, from experiencing this, is the training alone, being in a classroom and offering training and providing data and research mm -hmm. and, and, you know, implicit bias training, I think it's good, important, and necessary, but that alone does not change and alter behavior and, and actions, right? It's allowing members of law enforcement to actually interact and touch and engage and do life alongside members of the community that studies and data has shown has altered behavior when it comes to biases and prejudice and, and, and you know and racist you know beliefs mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because now when you are put in a position and you're required to problem solve and come up with solutions with members of the community that you are interacting with now you're looking oh wow like you know, you you kind of cool. You you all right, or you know, I am cool. You are very cool, Key. And and oh, officer so and so, you you all right. So studies show that that has had a more long term effect on changing and altering perceptions and behavior than just providing information in a in a training or classroom setting. So one of the things that we've been doing is we do these series of things called barbershop rap sessions, mm -hmm. where we invite officers to come into the barbershop in the, in the black communities, and we sit down and we really talk candidly and openly about, I mean, that's the only way you can talk in the barbershop, is candidly and openly, right, it gets real, about what are some of the issues that are taking place. And then we're not, it's not an us against them scenario. As members of this community, you know, you, you happen to be members of law enforcement, we are very concerned community leaders and advocates. How are we going to come together and resolve and address these issues. So now we're coming together as members of the same community because trying to solve a problem that you are a part of, independent of you and your voice and your input, is virtually impossible. Yeah, Scott, I want, you, I want to bring you in there and, and get your reactions to what you've heard. And then um, we'll take the next few minutes to open it up for those, for anyone who has questions or solutions. Um, and then we'll do, we'll do a two minute wrap up. Yes. Not of this panel, but of the day. Cool. I, um, I, I'm not going to try not to say too much more because I feel like I took a lot of time with my opening. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, but I did want to just clarify my point around talking to police. I didn't mean that like communities and police should never have a conversation. Like the barbershop thing sounds cool. Um, as long as you know they're not going to arrest anybody if they if I see a dime bag fall on the floor. So, so, is, every, so, is, so, um, so is everybody allowed in the barbershop? Because women typically are not. Well, women in my barbershop all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, we have a salon. A oh, so you have a separate space. I didn't say separate. <laughs> that's an I, emphasis on I didn't, separate. I didn't say separate. I said a, that's, that's universal for salon. That, that, a salon. Yeah. All right, well, I know we want to get to some questions. So, <laughs> uh, But yeah, real quickly. I, Tracy, my, you should I, call them out. I mean, I, I'm just calling it. I mean, okay. every time I'm in a barbershop, this conversation stops. I'm just No, that's real. And I go to a barbershop. That's actually what, I'm saying it. That's what I thought, too, when he said it's always real. It's not always real. True. That's right. you, can you defend your barbershop, <laughs> male only, <laughs> separate but equal? I, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to concur with uh, Tracy that, yes, when the women leave the barbershop, that's it changes. Right. Totally um, now, same, same thing when the cops leave, right? Uh, to segue back. Totally but yeah, my point was that, um, was actually along the lines of what you said, Tracy, earlier, which is cops have, need to learn to listen, mm -hmm. right? And that we often when we have these conversations, it's framed almost as a negotiation between right. the communities and police. Right. And, you know, someone was making the point earlier about how this is a fundamentally a question of democracy and who the government works for and, you know, Police need to be listening to communities, to, at, but when we're having a negotiation about what we want, that's a conversation within the community, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. so. All right, let's let's open it up. So um, there are there are mics. If it would be easier for people, if not, maybe. So I've heard data whistleblowing, federal backstop, empower community, more women, uh, limit police to their responsibilities. So some real concrete solutions here, in addition to the ones that were mentioned. Uh, at the very beginning of the panel. So great job, panel. Uh, I've been here all, almost all day. 
and I feel like I've kind of ri ridden the wave of emotion, you know, mm -hmm. being really crushed in the morning uh, and feeling worse for people who have had it much worse than I have. And then, you know, like feeling something really positive in my heart when the when the faith leaders came out, you know, feeling good right now. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm still not sure where I am. And when I hear uh, a lot of the policy solutions, like the uh, professors Russian and Robinson mentioned, I'm, I'm happy to hear about them. I really am, and I think they're great ideas. But at the end of the day, I think that a lot of the problem lies in an intersection between law, sociology, and where that all just meets people. Mm -hmm. So one of the first run-ins that I remember with the police was when I was four and I was with my dad, and we went to the bakery, and a cop followed us there. And next thing I know, they're swarming the bakery. They're pulling guns on my dad. They're putting their hands on him. And I'm sitting in the car, and I'm four years old. And I'm just so scared, and I have no idea what's going to happen. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. That's how I always think about police. So when I hear solutions, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of them. I don't know that I can ever trust a policeman. And I don't know that they can ever, you know, treat me in a fair way. And so when I hear, uh, when I hear true talking, I, I don't, I, like I, I understand what you went through, that situation in Los Angeles. And for the other people who have been through stuff like that, I, I just don't know how they can ever learn to trust the police. Now the police are ever gonna learn to treat them right. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if through all the policy, through all the sociology stuff, do you guys believe that like there's a, there's a better place forward? Because after all I've heard today, and all I've been really happy to see today, I don't, I don't know that I do. I'm still just pessimistic. If I, thank you for your comment. And if I, if I may just touch on that for a second. And it took a long time for me to get back to, to, to the place where I am today. And I, I will say that I am really good friends with a lot of police officers um, throughout the Triangle area and throughout the state of North Carolina. And I wouldn't believe this would be the case uh, several years ago after some of the experiences that I had. But I'll tell you two things. Frequency breeds familiarity, and familiarity breeds trust. So putting yourself in positions to spend some time with them. And at the end of the day, I do believe that you can get to that place as, as I did. And it's the policies and the processes and the procedures and all of that stuff is all fine and good. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a heart condition, mm -hmm. right? And all of that other stuff is what it is. But I, I read somewhere that the importance of above all things, guard your heart, because it's the things of the heart that will dictate the course of your life. Yeah, and if I can just jump in on that as well, we don't know how this will go over the longer term, but I'll just tell you from my career, uh, having seen the police organizations, and I've worked a lot with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and five or 10 years ago, going to their meetings, I would never have said this, but things since Ferguson have really impacted members of that group. And you can now see police leaders shaken by what has occurred in this country. And taking the President's Task Force report as an example, they are paying attention. Now, it doesn't mean that everything has changed. It doesn't mean that, that officers at the line level have changed 180 degrees or anything like that. But officers, or police chiefs rather, across this country are paying attention. And I'll just tell you very, very quickly, an anecdote that I was recently in Southern Virginia uh, on a panel with a chief and his deputy from Southside, Virginia, once the center of resistance toward uh, integration in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And with us were chiefs and city managers from rural jurisdictions throughout Virginia. I was talking about the same kind of things about procedural justice, implicit bias training, and other things uh, from this task force report, expecting a pretty hostile uh, reaction. Uh, and everyone in the audience was agreeing with what I talked about. Now, again, it, it's no uh, evidence 
of thorough change, but it is a change from what it's been in recent years. So one has to just look for uh, kind of signals of change along the way uh, and keep working. Monica? Oh, sorry, Scott, did you want to get, get in there? Oh, sorry, I don't mean to, I want to try to disrupt. No, I had please. to kind of follow up to what Lori was saying. I, 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 I have had that same experience with IACP, uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police, that they're, they seem to be more responsive post-Ferguson. Um, I learned through running, on it, running up on them at, with a protest, but either way. <laughs> um, and, uh, but what I, heard, what I heard from them was, it's the unions. Like Directly, they blame the unions for the inability to really change things. But then the other thing is that, I heard you say that the, we don't, you're not suggesting that's a one, there's also a 180 shift on the rank and file, but I feel like there's evidence to suggest that there's an opposite impact on the rank and file when, you, when we look at some of the public opinion right. polling, uh, the Pew Foundation did, uh, yep. that pu like <coughs> policing, I believe the Pew, uh, about a month back or so, showing that <coughs> police have really responded negatively, especially white officers. It gets back to this difference yep. between black and white officers. The, the, the racial difference was pretty much reflected about the societal difference in terms of how people view um, the issues with policing, even with even among police. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, wouldn't you agree that the evidence shows that police are actually have gotten more defensive, less, have, most of them have not embraced the messages coming out of communities pushing back or pushing for reform? Yeah, I think defensive is the right word. Defensive, and I would also say that there is um, confusion. Um, and I think that defensiveness in a sense that we don't understand, you know, I have officers tell me, I don't understand, you know, crime is low, why aren't people like happy, right? And that clearly tells you that there's, there's other things going on there. Mm -hmm. But I also think that um, there is a sense of, with all that's happening over the last five years or so, a lot of mixed messages about policing. And when you get mixed messages and when you have leaders that embrace and then you get start to trickle down and I mean you have organizational all kinds of things going on inside an organization that are you know pushing and pulling and, and saying this isn't right, you, you have to manage that. And one of the things that we have not historically done is on officers of the on the street is give them voice in what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, they don't create policy. They never have. When your sergeant turns to you and says, do this, you do this, right? And so decades of just being pushed to silence and, and to produce has created another sort of issue that we are, we're trying to figure out how do we unpack that. And that is, you know, after decades of saying, well, you know, Tracy's just complaining and whining, pass on, you know, how do you begin to tap into what's, go what's going on? You know, why are you so resistant? What's happening? Mm -hmm. And typically, it's not necessarily a community issue, it's an internal issue. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about internal, you know, fix the house first, because the house is reflective of what, how officers are, are acting outside. You know, when we talk about internal procedural justice, usually there's something systematically internally that's been unfair, mm -hmm. that has happened, or they felt they have been you know, disrespected or you know, a, a number of things. And that, the house has to be fixed mm -hmm. and attended to yep. if you want their behavior to change. I want to take one more question. Um, give us a last set of comments, and then I want to invite uh, two of my fabulous colleagues, Wesley Hogan and Christina Cleveland, to come up so we can wrap up both the panel and the day. Yeah. Well, first, I want to say, um, <clears throat> Lori and Tracy, thank you for your work on that 21st century police report. I thought it was incredible, and I, mm -hmm. I hope everyone adopts your recommendations. Um, but the thing I wanted to, to bring up again, and I know this has come up a couple of times, um, is the, the stop and frisk uh, piece. You know, so I'm, I'm a psychologist and, and a scientist, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm hoping maybe some of you lawyers can explain this to me, how um, a police person can't come into my home without a warrant, but they can search my body and touch me and violate me as a, as a human being just because they have a suspicion um, I've had clients who've been traumatized <laughs> from this kind of treatment, and I, I'm wondering what 
what we're doing about it and how is this okay and, and what we can do to make it stop, I guess. So. It's a turn of the lawyers. Yeah. Let's see if you can show up. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to um, make you feel any better, actually. I'm going to make you feel worse but because here's the, I just want to mention a couple things. So the reason police can do this is because the Supreme Court in Terry versus Ohio said, you can do this. Uh, so th that's the easy answer. But, not, but that's not where it ends. So let me just end with this. Not only does the, uh, do police, can police stop and frisk you if they have reasonable suspicion, and Guy, you would ask me to address this earlier. Let me just quickly say in a non-legal way, probable cause just means police have enough information that they can actually arrest you, right? So they have enough information that they think you've committed a crime, they can actually arrest you. Reasonable suspicion is someplace below that. But here's what the court did in addition to Terry. They allow officers to create reasonable suspicion, but only in communities that are already traumatized. So let me just say this. The Supreme Court has said, officers without any suspicion at all can follow you down the street, right? They can just follow you because a reasonable person would feel free to ignore the police presence. Once the police follow you, the Supreme Court also said they can show their authority without any suspicion at all. They can yell at you to stop. They can pull out a weapon and say, stop, if you don't stop. But what you do instead is you run away. Officers can chase you without any suspicion at all and tackle you to the ground without any suspicion at all. So, and if you are in a high crime neighborhood, which essentially means uh, indigent, majority, minority neighborhood, right? So that, that, that's what the Supreme Court and police officers think of as high crime because I have never been able to get a police officer on the stand to prove to me that a particular place was high in crime. It's just a euphemism for a community of color. What the Supreme Court says is if you flee in a high crime neighborhood, that creates the reasonable suspicion that allows an officer to tackle you to the ground and put their hands all over you. So what does all that mean? What it means is if you're an officer who's already out there and who needs to have a certain number of tickets to get their promotion, they can create reasonable suspicion. They just go into the community, they say, they pull out their weapon, they say, halt, and what do you do? You run in a community of color that is reasonably suspicious giving officers legal authority to put their hands on you and search you. That doesn't work in the affluent white communities because that's not a high crime neighborhood. And so you fleeing from the police is not reasonably suspicious. So I told you I was just gonna make it worse, right? This is the Supreme Court doctrine that allows this. And given that we have someone in office now who might be able to uh, appoint more people to the Supreme Court, I don't see that getting much better. Stephen, and just very quickly. On, yeah, but just add on a couple of things. A couple other problematic, not going to make it better, but courts are also very deferential to police judgments, so that makes it even more difficult to challenge it. And then as a procedural matter, it's also difficult to, to respond to a stop and frisk. It's difficult because you know, take like New York City where, you know, a, an enormous portion of all, this, of all the stop and frisks found no evidence. Now you've lost one of your greatest weapons to respond to that, which is evidentiary exclusion. You're not going to sue a police officer for a wrongful stop and frisk uh, for one individual person because it's a minimal harm that you've suffered. Um, so it, it really is a, a very serious problem. And I, everything Song said is totally right. I agree 100 percent. And I think that just adds to the, the scope of the problem that we're facing with it. Okay, so we're going to do two things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to thank this absolutely fabulous panel. It's a great way to close. The second thing, I am going to invite uh, my colleagues to come up. Um, this has been a pleasure working with the group of folks who have put together this forum. Um, they've been absolutely amazing. Real support from our Dean David Levy and from the Provost. And of course, none of it could have been done without the names of the people that are listed on this program. So they're going to spend a couple minutes, help us bring some closure, and then we'll send you on your way, hopefully empowered, uh, hopefully with a framework for thinking through and processing through some of the things that you've heard throughout the day. Christina and Wesley, two of the most amazing people that Duke has. Stephanie is another amazing one, but they're all amazing. It's Duke. <laughs> and yourself, Guy. Okay. Seriously. So everybody, we're going to end today's incredible 
set of conversations with a little history and with a little poem. The history focuses on a preposition. So one of the things that's been most useful to think about all of the things we've heard through today is that we're not responsible for the history that happened before we were born or before we came to consciousness. We're responsible to it today. We're not responsible for the history that happened before we were born, but we are responsible to it today. And here's a poem by Maza Dota, who is a young woman of color poet. Things that break, flowers, dawn, the ocean, our hearts. This is how gardens grow. This is how the sun blossoms. This is how we make it home. This is how we learn to love. So with that, you are all dismissed. Thank you. No.